webinar. My name is Kristen Burfels and I'm a project leader with OFIA. Please note that there is a chat room in the bottom right hand corner of your screen in the Adobe Connect room, which you can use to ask questions, share ideas, or respond to uh, polls and things of that nature throughout the webinar. We will be having a Q&A section at the end of the webinar for final questions, and we invite you to stand or move around throughout the webinar as we connect and learn together. We also invite you to follow along with us as we tour the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education curriculum, and we'll be sharing a link to that in the chat room window so you can access that uh, throughout the webinar. Today we will be hearing from Andrianne Flexeto and Karen Trotter, who will be sharing information on mental health. Andrian Flexato is a registered social worker and implementation coach at School Mental Health Ontario, a provincial implementation team designed to support Ontario school districts to enhance the mental health and well-being for all students. Andrian has acquired over 20 years of experience working in community, private, and school-based settings, providing direct service and advocating for children and youth mental health. Karen Trotter is the consultant for student health and well-being for Conseil Scolaire Catholique Providence in southwestern Ontario. She has been teaching for 20, 23 years, and 18 of which have been dedicated to the delivery of health and physical education curriculum from JK to grade 12. She is an OFIA ambassador, a longtime member of the Safety and Injury Prevention Advisory Committee, and of the OASB Executive. She is passionate about the health and well-being of all students and staff and advocates strongly for quality daily physical education. We'll be hearing from Karen first. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, my great pleasure to be spending the next hour with all of you discussing the topic of mental health literacy with regards to the elementary health and phys ed curriculum. Um, we are curious to know who's with us, and thanks to everyone who has already uh, responded to the poll, and we have such a vast um, audience today. It's very exciting. We have some health and phys ed specialists. We have um, teachers who teach their own HP and classes and classes for, for other teachers in the school. We have one faculty of education student. Welcome to you. Um, lots of lots of different people with us today, so I can't wait to see uh, what kind of um, interesting and, and enriching conversations we have in the next hour. Thank you so much for joining us. So by the end of the hour today, uh, it's really our hopes that you will have a clear understanding of the health and physical education elementary curriculum with, and specifically mental health literacy as a health topic, including how to implement and assess. We hope that you will feel more confident and comfortable implementing strategies to support learning about mental health across the health the, and physical education curriculum and within the health topic of mental health literacy in strand D, healthy living. And finally, that you will have an increased awareness of the resources of credible information on the H and PE and mental health literacy as a health topic. So before we get started, whoop, can you please share with us how knowledgeable you're feeling today about mental health education? So again, we'll have a pop-up poll, um, and we would like you to rate the degree of knowledge, of your degree of knowledge, sorry, about mental health education in the elementary health and phys ed curriculum. So we have lots of people who feel like they have a fair amount of knowledge. That's fantastic. Some a great deal, not some not so much. Well, hopefully you all will find some nuggets of information that will be useful for you today. Now we're going to hear from Andrian, who's going to share with us some invaluable information regarding mental health and mental health literacy. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much, uh, Karen and, and Kristen, for the introductions and, and for getting us started. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I see some familiar names on the line today, so welcome, welcome. Um, I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of School Mental Health Ontario and, and working alongside OPIA on this very important work. So uh, thank you very much for having us here with you. Um, to get us started on the discussion on mental health, let's take a look at some data from Ontario Student Drug Use and Health Survey and the Ontario Child and Health Study. 
So the good news is that overall, most students report feeling mentally well, with about 81% of students rating their mental health as good, very good, or excellent. So it's good news, right? Um, unfortunately, of the students who do have a mental illness, unfortunately, 22 to 34% will have access. Only, only the 22% will have access to professional mental health support. And although 31% of students indicated on the surveys that they did experience psychological distress, they didn't necessarily know where to turn for help. So this helps us sort of identify where we need to target our supports and, and what we should be doing next. Um, but just uh, if you don't mind playing along with us, what role do you think schools play in supporting mental health? So why don't you um, take just a moment and share your thoughts in the chat pod. So we won't have a pop-up window here, but if you can just start writing in the chat box, first of all, to let us know that you're still there and um, to let us know really what you think um, the role schools play in supporting mental health. So I'll just give it a few moments because I see people are, are quickly typing along. I wonder, I wonder which one's going to pop up first. Okay, awareness and prevention strategies. Great. Yeah, indeed. To identify agencies that can provide mental health assistance. Okay, good. Uh, so it's really about also making the connections, right, with our external partners and, and how uh, kids can, can get the support that they need. Um, so huge, yes, so a huge role, right? So many kids are struggling but don't always communicate openly with home guardians. Okay. Develop awareness of what mental health is. Yep. Offer strategies for daily coping with stress. Great. Um, yeah, and, and students spend most of their time at school. So, of course, yeah, it's a great place for us to, to play an important role. Oh, and they just keep coming in. So I'm, I'm reading them furiously, but I'm not going to cover all of them. I think it's a really good way for us all to get a good sense of, you know, why uh, it's important to talk about mental health at school. These are really all great examples. And, um, yeah, so thanks for your reflections. And, and, yes, more and more we recognize that school environments do play uh, a critical role in mental health promotion. And, and by school environments, I mean, you know, staff, right? We, we are the ones who are, are working within schools, so we have that role to play. And since many problems related to mental health and substance use do have a tendency to begin in childhood and adolescent years, school are real, schools are really the ideal place to introduce new learning opportunities through the curriculum to equip students with the knowledge and skills they need to support their mental and physical health throughout their lives. And I see people are still writing a little bit, so that's great. Thank you very much for that. So since mental health is an essential component of overall health, it makes sense that learning about mental health is included across curricula and specifically within, within and across the 2019 elementary health and physical education curriculum. So learning about mental health as an integrated part of a student's everyday school experience helps them to develop the knowledge and skills to be healthier and to reach their goals. So beyond this, they learn that it's okay to ask for help and how to access those mental health supports when they need it. So it really reflects what many of you were saying earlier or in the, in the chat box here. So we do have an essential role to play at so many different levels. Now, the updates to the 2019 elementary curriculum include opportunities to make those explicit connections between physical health and mental health. So we know that, you know, they're, they're, they're so interrelated. They're not one or the other, but they depend on one another and, and, and certainly work with one another. Uh, it includes content focused on better understanding mental health. It also includes opportunities to develop social-emotional learning skills that we discussed, I think, in the previous webinar. So if, if you had a chance to access that, uh, you can get a little bit more information about what that looks like throughout the curriculum as well. So I hope you can agree that, in fact, these concepts naturally fit within the elementary health and physical education curriculum where students are learning about healthy development as a whole. So it's really a, whole, a, a holistic approach, if you will. So given that schools were the most common setting for children and youth in, in Ontario to access mental health support, we know that plenty of anecdotal, from plenty of anecdotal experience and from research that educators have a real opportunity to make a positive impact on the lives of individual students and on the school community as a whole. 
So students are, are, schools are really an excellent place to promote positive mental health and wellness and to offer early identification and support when student mental health problems arise. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the Here Now Ontario survey or the, the report. It's going to pop out, uh, pop up in the in the chat box uh, momentarily. Um, but it's a recent report on student learning preferences related to learning about mental health. So what's interesting and not surprising to us is that the results indicated that students would much prefer to learn about mental health from teachers as part of their edu everyday educational experience. So if you get a chance, you're, you're welcome to check out the report um, that uh, is yeah, it's listed here in the, uh, in the box. So when we talk about mental health, we want to make sure that um, we understand the difference between mental health and mental illness. So there are two concepts that are often mistakenly used interchangeably. So to begin, let's take a look at how mental health is defined. So... The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. Now, the Public Health Agency of Canada extends this understanding as the capacity of each and all of us to feel, think, act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we're faced with. And it's a positive sense of emotional and spiritual well-being that reflects the importance of culture, equity, social justice, interconnections, and personal dignity. The definitions also reflect a First Nations mental wellness continuum that also considers mental health from a holistic perspective of hope, belonging, purpose, and meaning that's rooted in language and culture. So I, I don't think that these are concepts that are unfamiliar to you, but it's really important to make sure that we understand this distinction. And so when we talk about mental illness, we see that it's defined by mental health, or, or pardon me, Health, health Canada, as a range of illnesses that are characterized by alterations in thinking, mood, or behavior associated with significant distress and impaired functioning. So one in five Canadians have a diagnosed mental illness. Now, here the dual continuum can help us visualize the interaction between mental health and mental illness. So it highlights that it is possible to experience positive mental health while also living with mental illness. So as well, one could experience poor mental health without necessarily being diagnosed with a mental illness. So for, for some, I, I often... Uh, um, try to explain the concept a little bit differently and, and use the example of someone who uh, may have uh, an illness like diabetes. So this person can, in fact, lead a very healthy lifestyle by adopting everyday healthy practices, by receiving ongoing medical care, and by following recommended treatments and care. Um, and so a similar relationship exists between mental health and mental illness. So when we talk about mental health literacy, which is something that we've included, that has been included in the curriculum. We refer to acquiring knowledge about mental health and mental illness. So the concepts that we just uh, briefly uh, took a look at um, by exploring and reflecting on our beliefs and attitudes related to mental health and by building confidence in skills and actions that encourage positive mental health at school, at home, and in their communities. And it matters because it allows us to foster the conditions that support mentally healthy classrooms. It helps us to understand our roles and your role as educators in supporting student mental health. And it helps us to recognize when a student is struggling and in need of further support. So recognizing those signs, right? Those signs that we're not quite sure what's going on with them. Um, and also to know where to turn to, for help when the student is struggling. So these are all very, very essential when we're thinking about why it's important to have some understanding about, well, some kind of mental health literacy. So learning about mental health through the curriculum has been strengthened in three intentional ways. We know that there's strong evidence that learning about mental health in schools can contribute to the development of positive mental health. It contributes to reducing stigma about talking about mental health, specifically in connection to overall mental health. And it provides opportunities to build skills for help-seeking, for help 
and it may even reduce emotional and behavioral problems through the development of social emotional learning skills and a positive psychosocial environment. So a well-rounded curriculum can be a valuable instrument in ensuring comprehensive school-based mental health promotion and a community-wide approach to mental wellness that promotes mental health and helps prevent mental illness. So this is really what it's about. You know, we want to try and change that trajectory, right? We want to build those skills and build the awareness and the literacy to help us change how, um, how students are experiencing their mental health. So learning about mental health um, through the curriculum has been strengthened in those three intentional and explicit ways that I mentioned. So the first one is the introduction of Strand A, so social emotional learning skills for positive mental health, living and learning. You may know these formally as the living skills. And the second part is the addition of mental health literacy as an explicit health topic in Strand D uh, through the healthy living strand. And the third includes enhancements to existing curriculum expectations to highlight the connection between mental health and physical health as it relates to overall health within the curriculum. So it reinforces that holistic integrated approach to health, reminding us that it's not one or the other um, and they're not distinct, but certainly um, very, very well connected. So in the first, uh, in the introduction in strand A, the expectations focus on the development of social emotional learning skills, and it's based on evidence supporting the development of students' overall health and well-being. They also remain the same in all grades and are taught and assessed within the context of other strands. So with the example, of course, of showing developmental progression and application in each strand. So we want to make sure that there is a bit of there is differentiated learning, of course, across developmental stages. And the curriculum expectations are tagged to flag for education opportunities that this integrated teaching and learning. Now, the next part is the addition of the mental health literacy as explicit health topic in strand B. So this specific expectation related to this topic focuses on students' development of mental health knowledge and literacy in a developmentally appropriate way for each grade. So I mentioned that in the last one. We want to make sure that we're covering the same concepts um, but, of course, they're differentiated. And we can see that here in um, the example of strand D. So this, this particular chart helps us look at the same concepts and where they can fit across the developmental stages. So a key message for you to remember is that the enhancements to the existing curriculum expectations really aim to highlight the connection between mental health and physical health as it relates to overall health within the curriculum. So again, it reinforces that holistic integrated approach to health. So what's the connection between social emotional learning and mental health in the curriculum? So the point is that students learn these skills together and across other parts of the curriculum. So again, they're integrated and developing those skills to support mental health is something that can happen across the curriculum, beyond the curriculum, throughout our everyday school experiences and at home and in the community. So that was a bit of an overview of the mental health piece, and I'm going to turn it back over to Karen to uh, discuss the considerations for program planning and assessment. Thanks, Andrea. So yes, what are some of the considerations for program planning and assessment of mental health literacy? So as educators, we use a variety of assessment strategies to gather information about our students' learning. The Ministry of Education document Growing Success indicates that these strategies should be triangulated to include observations, student-teacher conversations, and student products. Many of the mental health literacy learning expectations, sorry, I forgot to switch the slide, can be assessed and evaluated through conversation and observations with students and occur over time. Examples could include, but are not limited to student self-assessment, or reflections, exit passes, journal entries, student-teacher conferences, and anecdotal rec recording charts. The assessment and our evaluation tool should reflect the categories of assessment which are represented in the achievement chart, so knowledge and understanding, thinking, application, and communication. So let's have a look at a couple of grade two curriculum expectations from, the strand, from strand D Healthy Living with respect to mental health literacy. So D1.6 
um, students should demonstrate an understanding of how a person's body and brain respond to challenging or uncomfortable situations and describe what they can do to feel better at those times. And D2.5, students will explain how understanding and being able to name their feelings can help in knowing when they might need to get help. So what we'd like you to do now is write in the chat pod what you think the key words are for these two expectations. So take a minute, review them, I'll read them again, and type in the chat pod some of the key learnings and keywords that you that you see in these expectations. So demonstrate an understanding of how a person's body and brain respond to challenging or uncomfortable situations and describe what they can do to feel better and explain how understanding and being able to name their feelings can help in knowing when they might need to get help. I see lots of people are typing, lots of key learnings in these two expectations. So being able to name their feelings Great. How about um, responding? How about uh, challenging and uncomfortable situations? Body and brain together. How to feel better. Recognizing the need to get help. Naming our feelings are, is essential. Excellent. Great. So you've got the, the gist of it. Um, one thing that we want to remember is that it's imp um, it's very important that teachers see evidence of all of these key words and key understandings in order to assess the student's achievement of these specific expectations. So the cognitive triangle that you see on this slide is a useful representation of the relationship that exists between our thoughts, our emotions, and our behaviors. What we think affects how we feel and act. What we do affects how we think and feel, and how we feel affects what we think and do. This can be a useful tool when, um, when teaching uh, students about, about these relationships. So here are a few examples of activities and tools that we can use with our students in grade two. The first activity would be to co-create an individualized feelings chart about what your body might look like, sound like, and feel like when you're feeling certain emotions. So when you're happy, you're angry, you're stressed. We can highlight that we all may look and sound and feel different when we are feeling these emotions, hence the, the um, importance of creating an individualized chart. The charts can also be built out to support students in recognizing how their body and brain reacts to these emotions. Um, what we want students to understand that your, um, your emotions are connected to how your body and brain react. So again, we, we go back to that triangle. Um, for example, when you're frustrated in activity in physical education class, what goes through your mind? What may be an instinct reaction when you feel like a game is unfair or someone's cheating? What do you need when you are going through these emotions so that you are able to make your problem smaller? A second activity would be a mindful moment toolkit. So it would be great to co-create a toolbox for students to use with strategies on how to cope with the feelings they're experiencing. You could create a mindful moment toolbox in your gymnasium or your classroom for students to access anytime they need to during physical education or class. And finally, um, a discussion with students about what size is your problem. So identifying what a pebble size, a rock size versus a boulder size problem, what, what they look like and what they are, and how to manage the feelings when experiencing these challenges. So together with students, we can co-create strategies that can help shrink the problem. Let's now have a look at some of the grade five curriculum expectations in mental health literacy. The first one, uh, D2.6, students should demonstrate an understanding of their role and the limits of their role in helping others who may need mental health support. And the second one is demonstrate an understanding of how our attitudes about mental health affect those around us and how they might contribute to or prevent creating stigma. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing, to go over these two expectations and to highlight what are the key words and key understandings that we need to, um, that need to be reflected when we're assessing students. Lots of writing. Again, we want them to understand the 
their role and the limits of their role in helping others, and we want them to understand how their attitudes about mental health affect others and how they might contribute to or prevent stigma. So again, understanding their role and the fact that they have limits. Students need to know when, in, when they are in over their head. Very good. Where's the line for what I can and can't do to support others? Attitudes about mental health, stigma, know when you need to get help. Perfect. Okay. So, what are some activities or some strategies that we can use to reduce the stigma of mental health? One thing we might do is co-develop a definition of stigma and discuss with students how this can impact a person's mental health. We need to get students to find ways um, to recognize how their words, their actions, and their attitudes can contribute to or prevent stigma, and how they can work to ensure that stigma is not something they are a part of. When we look at stigma, we can explore what it means and how students' words, actions, and attitudes can either contribute to or prevent stigma. And they also need to understand that it's not just a matter of using the wrong word or action. That stigma is really about disrespect. So the Canadian Mental Health Association, CanWeTalk.ca, proposes the WALLS acronym to reduce stigma, which is what you're seeing on your slide. So the first thing is to watch your language. So to make sure you are not using language or comments that stigmatize people. We want to ask questions. So a lot can be learned by asking questions about mental health. We want to learn more. So great resources are available online to help educate you on different mental illnesses. Increased education means fewer misunderstandings and less stigma. Listen to experiences. Once you have learned a bit about mental health, consider asking someone you know about their experience with mental health. If you're considerate and respectful, they may be comfortable speaking about their experiences. If you have lived experience, please consider sharing your story with others. And finally, speak out. So helping help reduce stigma by speaking out when others stigmatize people with mental health or spread mid, mid, misconceptions. Pardon me. All right. So here are some activities um, what we can do with grade five students to help them understand their role and the limits of their role in helping others. So the first activity would be having a discussion about what quality friendships look like. So talk to students about what they value in a quality friendship. Discuss their roles in friendship and how one can support the other during a challenging time, maybe spending time together and being available to talk when needed. Um, identify what are controllable ways they can support a friend by listening to them when they're ready to talk. Identify the difference and how to recognize, accept, and manage emotions through role-playing scenarios. For example, uh, let's say you notice a mood change or a behavior change in a friend, such as they don't really want to join the group anymore. What could you do to help that friend? Or if you're feeling stressed with the amount of homework you have or upset about not making a team or feeling committed, uh, feeling overcommitted, not being able to stay focused. So what are some strategies you can use to help prioritize and also be in the state to work and learn? Consider applying learning through role-playing scenarios. For example, a classmate always ends up crying when they're alone. Your peers are making fun of them because this student is constantly showing their emotions. So take a minute and discuss with students what are some possible reasons why this student might be crying. What are some choices that you have to contribute to or support the situation? Another activity um, is to emphasize the importance of physical activity. So making connections with students to how one feels before, during, and after physical activity both physically and mentally. So how does physical activity support your mental health? And a last activity would be um, an activity which reinforces the importance of self-care. So remind students that in order to be able to support a friend, we also need to be able to take care of ourselves. Creating a Venn diagram using the following labels, so maybe uh, the one uh, column would be the heart, the next would be the brain, and the last would be the body. 
So we want to brainstorm ways to care for each of the three areas. For example, to, in order to take care of our hearts, we need to exercise. We want to do good deeds for others. We want to eat properly. Uh, to take care of our brain, we need to do some reading and learning. We need to decrease our screen time and um, spend some time and, and social interactions with friends. And in order to take care of our bodies, we want to exercise, we want to eat properly, and we need to get enough sleep. So those are just a few ideas of activities that we can do um, to reinforce those um, expectations. And finally, let's look at an expectation from the grade seven curriculum. So students will demonstrate an understanding of the relationship between mental health and mental illness and identify possible signs of mental health problems. Um, once again, what I'm gonna ask you to do is reread the expectation and in the chat box, just uh, pull out again those keywords and key understandings that we need in order to properly assess uh, student learning of this expectation. Lots of people typing. So great to have such an engaged audience. We have um, relationship, definitely mental health, mental illness, the relationship between the two, mental health problems, what is mental health, personal characteristics, illnesses can be managed and people can lead essentially healthy lives. Excellent. Great. Thanks for your contribution. So as Andrea uh, mentioned previously, the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own, own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Mental illness is defined by Health Canada as a range of illnesses that are characterized by alterations in thinking, mood, or behavior associated with significant distress and impaired functioning. Unfortunately, one in five Canadians have a diagnosed mental illness. So we can look at these two concepts as part of a mental health, mental illness continuum. So mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. Some people think about these two things occurring along a continuum to illustrate that we all find ourselves somewhere between these two points and that our positioning can vary from day to day depending on our circumstances. Others have broadened this idea to highlight that even when experiencing a mental illness, which Andrian mentioned before, it is absolutely possible to feel mentally well. So this is sometimes called the dual continuum model, which you see on the slide. Okay, so here are some um, ideas for a culminating activity with grade seven students to show that taking care of our own mental health is important too. So we would start with a discussion about how I can support and maintain my own mental health. So we could possibly create a list of me, we, and us strategies that students can use to help build a sense of positive mental health. For example, some me strategies might include finding ways to embed movement during the day, taking the time to enjoy doing a hobby, and making sure, making sure, sorry, that we're getting enough sleep. Some we strategies might be calling up a friend to spend some time together, going to play at the community center, or to the playground with a group of friends. And some us strategies might include volunteering in the community, helping a teacher out in the classroom. So once we've completed these lists, we might reinforce, let's say, the me strategies with an activity like um, taking students through a variety of non-traditional physical, physical activities, so things that we don't do normally, yoga, swimming, bowling, tobogganing, and ask them to assess how they feel physically and emotionally before, during, and after um, the activities. So how, how do you feel physically and emotionally after doing these physical activities? And then um, together we'll make some connections with the value of daily physical activity. So that's just one example. Now what I'm asking you to do in the chat is give us some ideas of how you would alter or add to this activity and which curriculum expectations would this address. So I'm going to give you a minute. So we proposed some me activities and we want this to be kind of a culminating um, activity. So 
what can you propose? So what are some things we would add or what could we modify the activity? This is a tough one. <laughs> like developing a lesson plan in 30 seconds. Go. There we go. Thanks, Pam. So journaling how each person takes care of themselves on their own, building with others, and finally as a group. Great idea. Participate in the physical activity for half an hour a day and journal each day. Another great idea. Lots of people still sharing. A culmination would be to create a self-care toolkit. I love that. All right, so I'm going to let you continue to read um, everyone's great ideas. So here are some um, additional video resources that may help support student learning about mental health and mental health literacy. The first one is called We All Have Mental Health, and it's an animation designed to give young people aged 11 to 14 a common language and understanding of what we mean by mental health and how we can look after it. It could be used with students in grade seven as it's related to mental health and talks about signs of potential mental health problems. Or it could be used with grade five students as it talks about how to seek help, um, starting with friends, and then also lots of ideas about self-care. The second video is Break the Stigma. And it brings to light the idea that it's not easy to admit that we or someone we love might have challenges managing our thoughts and feelings. In the video, um, there are discussions around why our culture has created an environment of shame and what we can all do to give each other the support we need to get help. And finally, the third video is the Duchess of Cambridge introduces animated film on mental health. So in this video, um, there are references to the small and big pro problems that we talked about um, earlier with the rock analogy. And um, who to talk to, so probably it be, would be best to support the expectations in the grade five curriculum. So do you have any resources that you use for reference or in the classroom? And if you do, please share with us in the chat pod. So what are some of the assessment and evaluation fundamental principles we need to consider when we're assessing mental health literacy? So what I'm gonna do, um, since we have a bit of time, have there ha, have you had any um, assessment concerns voiced to you about you know um, assessing mental health and mental health literacy? So any concerns or anything you can think of that might be a concern for educators? So if you do, if you can think of anything, just pop it up in the chat box, and maybe we're. Together, we'd be able to uh, co-create some strategies for you. So any issues or any concerns right now about assessing mental health and mental health literacy? We have a couple people typing. It's not really, I, I know it's, it's a tough topic. So how can we assess students' mental health? Hmm, interesting question. And I have to say that that's not really our purpose in the curriculum, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, and remember, if you have any solutions to these challenges, please feel free to type them in, uh, in the chat box. Are students comfortable sharing? We know that not always, especially if they're in, in a situation where, they're not, where they don't feel comfortable. If there's a new, a new teacher or someone different, thank you for the uh, the the resource share, Karen, um, the Stress Lessons Toolkit, grades four to six. And if I, if I understand correctly, there are resources, and even in French, for those of you who maybe um, are, are teaching immersion, resources now for grades one to three as well. Okay, so we bring up lots of, lots of interesting challenges, and I'll let you keep typing, um, but we'll move on just a little bit. So to address the question, um, how can we assess students' mental health? And as I said, that's not really our objective. So as educators, we are not assessing students' mental health. We are simply um, assessing their understanding and ability to demonstrate their knowledge of mental health. So it's kind of um, just like we do with, with um, we assess, we don't 
assess students' eating patterns when we're um, assessing healthy eating, but we're really assessing their understanding and their ability to demonstrate their knowledge on healthy eating, right? So we're not evaluating what they're eating or what their habits are, but their ability to, to understand um, the knowledge about what, what they should be eating and what their habits should look like. So on the slides, you see images of two documents which, which are vital in support of assessment and evaluation practices. So the primary purpose of assessment we know, um, and about, sorry, assessment and evaluation is to improve student learning. So in this webinar, we'll focus on growing success and the 2019 elementary curricular, curriculum. Pardon me. The curriculum is comprised of content and performance standards. The content standards are the overall and specific curriculum expectations identified in the curriculum documents for every subject and discipline. The performance standards are outlined in the achievement chart, which is provided in the curriculum documents for every subject or discipline. And in our document, they, it's found on pages 52 and 53. So the purpose of the achievement chart is to provide a common framework that encompasses all curriculum expectations for all subjects and courses across grades to guide the development of high quality assessment tasks and tools, for example, rating scales and rubrics. It's to help teachers to plan instruction for learning and to provide a basis for consistent and meaningful feedback to students in relation to provincial content and performance standards. And finally, to establish categories and criteria with which to assess and evaluate students' learning. The achievement chart supports criterion referenced assessment and evaluation and identifies four categories of knowledge and skills. As we know, knowledge and understanding, thinking, communication, and application. The following, following seven fundamental principles lay the foundation for rich and challenging practice. When these principles are fully understood and observed by all teachers, they will guide the collection of meaningful information that will help inform instructional decisions, promote student engagement, and improve student learning. To ensure that assessment and evaluation and reporting are valid and re reliable and that they lead to improvement of learning for all students, teachers use practices and procedures that are fair, transparent, and equitable for all students, support all students, including those with special education needs, those who are learning the language of instruction, either English or French, and those who are First Nation, Métis, or Inuit. Practices that are carefully planned to relate to the curriculum expectations and learning goals and as much as possible to the interests, learning styles, and preferences, preferences, needs, and experiences of all students. Practices that are communicated clearly to students and parents at the beginning of the school year or course and at other appropriate points throughout the school year or course. Practices that are ongoing, varied in nature, and administered over a period of time to provide multiple opportunities for students to demonstrate the full range of their learning. Practices that provide ongoing descriptive feedback that is clear, specific, meaningful, and timely to support improved learning and achievement. And finally, to develop students' self-assessment skills to enable them to assess their own learning, set specific goals, and plan next steps for their learning. So we're going to put you to work again. So what I need you to do is, uh, reflecting on the first four months with your students, in what ways are you supporting mental health and mental health literacy in your health and physical education classes? So that would be what in the first, um, in the chat box, not the chat box, you have three chat pods on your screen now. In the second chat pod, We'd like you to let us know what would you like to learn more about. And in the third one, what additional supports would be helpful to you? Okay, so feel free to type in all three boxes or whichever ones you choose. So again, number one is in what ways are you supporting mental health literacy in your classes? In the second box, we would like to know what would you like to learn more about? And in the third box, what additional supports would be helpful to you? So Rebecca says she uses the developmental relationship to express care and share the power. Oh, and we oh, this is the third box is always the one that's full. What additional supports would be helpful? So 
Allie says that complete unit plans for the new curriculum would be nice. Um, more classroom activities would be helpful. Andrea would like to learn more about additional strategies to use with students to build their strategy toolkit. Uh, Pascal says partnering with public health nurse for a bit of co-teaching and collaboration on other projects where she is able to establish and foster relationship with, with the students. That is so important. We were talking about um, students being comfortable. So topics that we address um, in the healthy living strand um, are difficult to, to discuss. So it's so important to develop those relationships with um, the public health nurses so that students do feel comfortable. Reading books related um, to the topic, discussion about zones and showing care, zones of regulation, again, very good. Mentally healthy classrooms resource, a quiet room with different activities, excellent. I lead and collaborate with TPH in my school in healthy school certification, fantastic. Again, zones so many, of regulation. So many Yes, so many. The Mind Up curriculum, Indigenous worldviews. Wow, we're really doing some great things already. And Souling Our Schools, great resource for all students, but excellent Indigenous mm -hmm. perspectives. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Angela would like to learn more about how mental health connects with inquiry. Whoa. Mm -hmm. That would be a great project, Angela. Jody is looking for interest short video clips that can support, illustrate some of the topics in a way that is relatable to the age group. Um, Andrea, is, she encourages a positive and healthy learning environment so students feel comfortable and safe. So, so, so important. I don't think we can um, enforce or reinforce that enough with our with teachers. Pam would like to know ways in which students could evaluate their own mental health in order to increase self-awareness and the need for mm -hmm. So many great things. We appreciate all of your all of your input. There were so many great ideas. I feel like, you know, some of the questions that were asked in, in the third pod can almost be responded by some of the great suggestions in the first pod because there were so many things so many great ways that um some of you are already um teaching about uh, mental health literacy. Um, and so those those two uh, really connect nicely. Thank you so much for that. Wonderful. Thanks for, for making those connections too, Andrea. Um, so we are going to move now into some additional resources. Um, so we are just going to uh, flip the slide here and then share the links to some of the Ministry of Education resources. Um, so that includes the website as well as information for parents and, of course, the growing success document that we have. And we will include include the links in the chat pod. And I would encourage you to continue to share additional resources that you've used, um, that you're planning on using. Please add them into the chat box so uh, we can all continue to share that information. And we will pass it back to you, Andrian, to talk a little bit about oh. some of your resources. Great. Well, I'm happy just to do a quick uh, overview of um, some of the resources you can find at School Mental Health Ontario. So the website is listed right here. Um, and you'll find a, a number of resources for um, so many different audiences from school boards. So you'll have, you know, leadership resources, educator resources, resources for mental health uh, professionals as well as, as developing resources for parents, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, we encourage you to take a look and, and see what the resources are. Um, there are some, um, I mean, the resources there to support the implementation of uh, SEL skills. Uh, but you also find um, some some of the resources to help build your own mental health literacy, if that's something that you're looking for. So we do have some some learning modules online. Um, we're also uh, working closely with the Ministry of Education to develop some learning modules um, that you should be able to access uh, in the next little while. So we'll, we'll certainly make note of that and let you know when they're available. And you'll probably learn about that also through uh, your own mental health leadership teams at your board. Um, so talking about great resources to tap into, uh, those mental health leaders are, are really great. So uh, yeah, School Mental Health Ontario does support um, the school boards, and so you'll find a lot of those resources online there. 
I noticed that somebody also mentioned the uh, everyday mental health um, classroom practices from ETFO. So uh, we did work with them on those, and uh, those are really great for, for everyday mental health practices if you're looking for some quick wins. All right, so some additional links that we'd want to share with you is the Ontario Association for the Support of Physical and Health Educators. So we do encourage you to visit OASC's website and follow them on social media, which you'll see in the chat pod uh, show up shortly. And we also wanted to highlight the link to the full webinar series as well as some other webinars that we have available. And that link uh, to the webinars will include um, both recordings as well as where you can find upcoming registrations, such as the Human Development and Sexual Health uh, webinar that we'll be delivering in February. The registration will be available at, the, uh, at that section of our website uh, shortly, so, so check out that, um, as well as that's where the recording for this uh, session today will be. We also have our curriculum resources, so we do encourage you to uh, visit um, our teaching tools website and check out those lesson plans. It is for subscribing school boards, so if you're not sure, um, you know, go in there, check them out, or feel free to connect with us if you have any questions. And there is a curriculum expectation uh, mapping chart in that uh, section of our teaching tools website that you can use as well to help support. Any new lesson plans or new units that we'll be uh, delivering, you know, this school year or into next will be identified in green, so do keep an eye out for those as well. All right, so we're moving into the last few minutes of our time together. So we did want to allow uh, an opportunity, if you have any questions for Andrean or Karen or any other participants that are on the line, to feel free to add those into the chat room. Um, and as we wait for some of those uh, questions to roll in, uh, we will be putting the poll back up for you to uh, let us know how confident you're feeling now um, at the end of this hour that we've had together. So please do uh, respond to that one. Hi, Karen. Thanks so much for your question. So we don't have a timeline at this point. Um, of course, as new information around timelines and when things are available, we will be communicating that through our e-connection, our social media, um, as well as to our contacts around the province. So stay tuned for more information on that. Great. So we're seeing uh, lots of folks responding to the uh, poll. So thank you for your responses to that. Um, we don't have too many other questions yet, but I will say that we'll stay on the line for another minute or two. Um, and if you have any last minute questions, feel free to add those in or connect with us. Um, and we will be sharing the link to the evaluation from today's webinar. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank both Andrea and Karen so much for sharing your wealth of information with all of us. Um, and for making some of these connections as we've all been learning together. And thank you to all the participants for your fantastic engagement. Um, this really makes it uh, such a stronger learning opportunity when we can learn from one another. So thank you for your participation. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure for me to be on the line um, and uh, really appreciate the, uh, the leadership from Ophia on this. So thank you so much, everybody, for being on the line today. Hi there. So somebody uh, was asking about social emotional learning skills and evaluation. Uh, thanks, Pascal, for flagging that. We do we did do a, a webinar in November on social emotional learning skills, um, and the recording to that is available through our webinar section of our website. Um, and we can pop in the link to that um, again in the chat room, and you can you can take a look at that. Wonderful. So we are going to close off now. I'd like to thank everybody again for your participation. Um, and thank you, Karen and Andrian. Have a great evening. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. Good afternoon. Bye.